Mari Martinez. I'm the Senior Vice President for Historic Sites at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Again, welcome to the Dynamic Leadership for Historic Sites Career Fair. Uh, we are here to talk to you about the great opportunities that we have at the National Trust. But before we get started, we feel like it's only right to do a land acknowledgement. And I'm coming to you from the Piscataway and Nakashak lands, as well as the land that potentially uh, was part of a former plantation here in Prince George's County, Maryland. Why is that important? Well, it's important to understand that the histories of these countries do involve um, anti-Blackness, anti-indigeneity, and things that lead to discriminatory practices. And what we're trying to do here with this career fair is to really be intentional about reaching out to each and every one to get, have them act, to have people have access to these great opportunities, these great jobs, these great careers that we have here at the National Trust. And so I wanted to give special thanks to my co-collaborators. Number one, I'd like to thank Elon Cook Lee, our Director of Interpretation and Education. She is the brainchild of this event. She has done great thinking, great creating around making sure that this event was accessible, that it was meaningful and purposeful for you all, as well as our organization. So I'd like to thank her for all of her thought leadership. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Dave Ferguson, who's our new talent acquisition specialist. Again, has been a tremendous asset already um, in his few months here at the Trust, helping us think through creating new ways and new conduits for us to get these opportunities out here, out there to communities. But I also want to thank uh, our great talented IT core, uh, Susie Latanzi and Gerald Thornton for providing support during this webinar. We've learned the power of webinars. We've learned the power of Zoom over the last two years. And this allows us to really uh, cast a wider net, which is really the intention and the goal of this, this program today. This past October of 2022, our Board of Trustees at the National Trust for Historic Preservation approved our historic sites portfolio for success. This portfolio is a three-year plan that's created by the Historic Site Task Force, which are made up of trustees in coalition with our Chief Preservation Officer. One of the key elements of the document that I wanted to share with you, and I quote, it says, an expanded commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion that acknowledges the need for significant progress in these areas at National Trust historic sites and asserts that fulfilling our charter requires that we steward a broad range of American architecture, tell the full history of our country, increase the diversity of staff and volunteer leadership, and engage new and diverse audiences. Listen, many of us have been on these calls before. Many of us have been in different conversations, both informal and formal, about doing diverse recruitment and, and making sure that our opportunities are accessible to everyone. We can go way back 22 years ago to uh, the year 2000, when Lonnie Bunch wrote the iconic essay, Flies in the Buttermilk, Museum's Diversity and the Will to Change, talking to us about the urgent need to diversify the museum profession. Certainly we've seen some progress since then. I mean, Mr. Bunch himself has been, uh, had been named the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Five years after that essay was out, and then 14 years after that appointment was appointed as the first African-American um, secretary of the Smithsonian. But we also know that there are countless studies revealing the historic and current inequities in our field. So what we decided to do was be proactive about our current opportunities and team up with three great organizations here today. One is the Association of African-American Museums, the second is Museum Hue, and the third is the Black Interpreters Guild. So what I would like to do now is uh, introduce these three organizations to you and allow them to say a few words. So the first person I'd like to introduce is the Executive Director of the Association of African-American Museums, Dr. Vedette Coleman-Robinson, who I'm happy to say um, we've been 
lead together. It's, she's my birthday twin. Uh, we've been uh, really co-conspirators around trying to lift up our Black museums and Black professionals in the field. And I'm also very happy to share that I'm the president of the board of directors for AAAM. Without further ado, with that, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Omar, and thank everyone at the Trust for having me tonight or having AAAM tonight. Um, this is very uh, different for us. We haven't been able to host anything of this magnitude. So thank you for uh, inviting AAAM to, to speak. Uh, for those of you who do not know, um, Triple AM. Well, we call it Triple AM. You may want to say AAAM if you want to do it the long way. Do not confuse us with Triple A because Vedette is not coming out to help you out with any tires or anything like that. It's not happening. But uh, we are a nonprofit member organization that, that was established to support African and African art museums and uh, every and interpreters throughout the country, but then also throughout the world. Um, what we really like to say in AAAM is that diversity begins with us. Um, before I was here, I was at the National Park Service and I and I worked very closely with the trust um, with trying to find diverse talent because a lot of times we hear, and we didn't hear a lot with the trust, but in the federal government or in, or in um, agencies period, we wind up hearing um, well, I don't know where the diverse talent is. So I say you need to look and, and reach out and reach across the, the table um, to individuals and organizations um, that know where to find diverse talent and uh, also know uh, who the folks are. Um, so as far as us aligning with casting a wider net, um, AAAM is always making sure that diverse talent is number one. We help the trust out tremendously and everybody else. I saw, I think I saw David on here. I don't know if he's speaking tonight or not, but um, you know, we we help the trust and other organizations out a lot, just trying to make sure that placements, um, people are placed in positions where their talent and their subject matter expertise matches the org matches the organization, but also matches their uh matches the position. Um, and we've been really successful at that. We do not do anything that's predatorial. Um, if we find that an organization, uh, and this is not anything that has to do with the trust, the trust is an amazing organization and that's why I'm here tonight. Um, but if we find out that a, an organization is not safe for our talent, um, I will very firmly say uh, no. I have no problem saying no, but tonight was not one of those nights. So I think I'm... Um, I'm trying not to make this all about AAAM tonight. As you guys know, I get, uh, I'm the executive director to do all the stuff. So I'm going to pass the mic over to whomever is next. I think I pass it back to Omar. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for those kind words and allowing uh, all of our attendees to get to know AAAM a little bit better. Next, I'd like to introduce Miss Stephanie Johnson Cunningham, co-founder and current executive director of Museum Hugh. I've also had the pleasure of being the first national board chair of this great organization. They've been really cutting edge at the forefront of bringing Black professionals of color together in this sector and adjacent sectors. So without further ado, Stephanie, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Omar, and thank you for the years of support uh, for Museum Hugh um, that you've shown. Um, and also, I wanted to thank the National Trust for having Museum Hugh um, and giving us an opportunity to just talk about, you know, the work that we've been doing over the years. Uh, so Museum Hugh was founded in 2015, really to look at the needs for greater representation in arts and culture in New York, specifically at first, uh, where we are based. And so it was really critical for us to think about ways to get more museum professionals of color in the door. And so we would provide guided experiences and professional development workshops um, to just introduce our community to different opportunities in the field and showing them how to gain different skills. Um, and so that was really how Museum Hugh got its start. And also having the opportunity to learn about different 
things happening in the field, like the Association of African American Museum and like National Trust, um, uh, uh, as a way for people to gain networks as well as different jobs in the field too. And so it's been really great having the opportunity for the past seven um, years working with museums around the country to help implement more uh, candidates of color within their institution, as well as, you know, assisting in looking at their board and their entire approach um, in the field. And so I'm really excited to learn more along with you all how the National Trust for Historic Preservation is also supporting um, leaders of color. Thank you, Stephanie. Very proud of how you continue to lead this effort. And uh, we continue to, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're finding new ways to continue to work together on these important issues. So thirdly, the last group I'd like to introduce to this great partnership is the Black Interpreters Guild led by our very own Elon Cook Lee. We did have an opportunity in my past job to work together on a much smaller scale, doing something similar. And so I knew this would be right with her uh, as a partner in this effort. So I wanna allow Elon to talk to you all from the Black Interpreters Guild, thank you. Thank you and hey everyone. And I already see there's a bunch of Black Interpreters Guild members in the chat. I'm so, I mean, in the uh, participants list, I'm super excited to see everybody again. So for those of you all haven't heard of the Black Interpreters Guild, we're an online safe space, it's primarily on Facebook for people who identify as Black, who are professionals and hobbyists um, and experts within cultural heritage and national resources. So we have tour guides and park rangers. We have curators and museum educators. We have docents. We have artists um, who are working, uh, who are doing a lot of interpretation work with the public. So we have a really fanta fantastic group about um, of over 200 members who are spread all around the country and a few folks in other parts of the world. And we're a space for having conversations, for organizing and strategizing, for uh, talking to each other and, and relating, relaxing, releasing after really challenging times. And we're also a group that was actually was created at AAAM, um, I think it was in 2016, and it was actually partially in reaction to the deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, and that being um, those being incidents and the 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 rampant killings of Black folks that were going on or that continue to go on, um, but the ways in which that was negatively impacting frontline workers of color uh, at historic sites. And the ways in which uh, the long legacy of slavery and white supremacy connects between what we interpret and our bodies and how the public reads our bodies. So um, if you're interested in learning more, please check out, I put the link in the chat for the Black Interpreters Guild and also for Museum Hue and uh, AAAM, which their website is the blackmuseums.org. So definitely please um, join us and um, check out our work. And I'm now going to pass our virtual microphone back to Omar uh, for our next conversation. All right, this is the part where I get to talk to you about the National Trust, which is my new organization. I've been here since the 5th of July of this year. It's been a wonderful journey getting out there to visit the sites and getting to know the people and see the passion and concern for people that my colleagues have in telling the full American story I did want to say before I get into that general overview that we are, we are as Elon said, we are taping these sessions and we're hoping to work with other groups that represent other demographics as well that are on the margins. I know I had a quick conversation uh, through email with Sayla from Latinos and Heritage Con uh, Conservation and there are other groups. Once this, once this, uh, this YouTube link will be available, We'll send it out through our socials. Please feel free to send it out to other organizations that you think um, are also on the margins that may have not been able to come and attend today. But let me go on and describe the National Trust. If you could uh, share the next slide. So our portfolio for the Historic Sites Department is uh, 
these these uh, 27 open historic properties. Uh, we sort of have two properties and one at Woodlawn and Pope Leahy in Virginia. Uh, you have eight, thousands of acres, many roof structures, and thousands upon thousands of objects in our collection and artifacts. We have six affiliated sites as well, um, which are part of our three designations. We have our stewardship sites, which are the ones that we own and operate. Uh, we have, those are the jobs that we'll be focused on mostly today, but we'll be talking to you about opportunities at our other sites as well. Second designation is our co-stewardship sites. Those are ones that we own and then another nonprofit operates. And then we have affiliates and the affiliates we neither own nor operate, but they are part of our professional community of learning. Uh, we share branding, we share professional development and best practices in the work that we're doing. Just to give you an idea um, with our headquarters staff uh, for our historic sites department, we have people like Elon who are focused on interpretation and education. We have people focused on site administration. So we have a chief administrative officer. We have an architect and someone who really oversees our preservation projects. And we also have uh, a leader who helps us with our museum collection. So how our job site looks. Our job site um, is, has only jobs for our stewardship sites and our headquarters. And so you'll see some of them listed there. We are going to look at jobs that are, um, that are at the executive director level. You'll, you'll see jobs we'll talk about that are at the senior manager level. And then we'll have a whole plethora of jobs that we'll also uh, talk about that fall outside of those different levels as well. I did want to talk, give you a little context of where our historic sites uh, department resides in. It resides in our larger preservation division. In our preservation division, we have um, we have we have departments like um, the African American uh, Culture Heritage and Action Fund. Uh, which is run by our very own Brett Legs. We have the Preservation um, Services and Outreach run by Robert Newig. We have Research and Development run by D. Gao and Government Relations run by Shaw Sprague. So that's, that's part of the, the larger division that our Historic Sites Department is part of. And then just kind of taking the, the lens out a little bit wider to show you the sort of vastness of the National Trust is that the preservation division sits alongside of the legal division, marketing division, development, finance, and administration. So we are a large organization. We're almost 75 years old, and we cover, we have sites and offices all across the United States. I did want to let you know that at the National Trust for several years now, there's been a diversity, equity, and accessibility inclusion movement. There's a committee right now that's called the Leadership Council, and it's also filled with liaisons to represent all these different departments and divisions I just listed. Uh, they, have, they have a lot of different things that they're doing. One of the things they just completed uh, that Elon and I took, a part of, took part of was creating an inclusive language guideline. For all, of, for all of our staff to reference as we continue to create safe spaces and places of belonging at all of our sites and in our departments and offices. But most importantly, one of their goals, which this particular program falls in full alignment with, is evolving our recruitment and orientation practices and materials to ensure the promotion of diversity, equi equity, accessibility, and inclusion. And so we wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that. And during our small breakout sessions, feel free to ask questions about that, as well as when we close out at the very end. So I'll start us off. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you all today about our executive director and our deputy director positions. So right now at our stewardship sites, we have three open positions. One is at the Shadows on the Test Historic Site in New Iberia, Louisiana. It's a very exciting opportunity at the site of enslavement um, in the South. We just had, uh, we just signed off on a brand new memorandum of understanding where we have a new partnership with the Iberian African American Historical Society. 
where, where they actually share a space in our visitor center that's now a resource center for them. So now we get to co-collaborate intimately with a group of individuals that really care about telling the full story about those who are formerly enslaved at that site and their descendants. Secondly, we have a great opportunity at the Chesterwood National Historic Site, another executive director position. Chesterwood is the home of Daniel Chester French. You all may know his work. If you ever visited the National Mall and looked at the Lincoln Memorial, he is the one who created that statue, as, as well as created the Minuteman and many other works uh, throughout his career. So we interpret the historic home and studio that he had in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And we're now looking for a new leader to lead that effort. There's great work being done right now in creating an artist in residence space. So it's a great opportunity for a manager who has a vision to really uplift artists, especially ones who do who work in um, work in the medium of sculpture. And we also are looking at cultivating uh, other, other relationships within the Berkshires. Um, look, uh, we have a, a, a burgeoning partnership with an organization uh, called the uh, Berkshire Black Economic Council. Um, and we're looking to continue to build on that as well as um, other, other relationships that have been continued to be built at the, at, the, at the Chesterwood site. Then we have the third position at, De at the Woodrow Wilson House, a presidential site right here in Washington, D.C. We have a deputy director position. And this deputy director will be the number two to our number one over there, Elizabeth Karcher. Um, and this person will have the opportunity to help co-lead this great site that talks about uh, Woodrow Wilson that has been doing a lot of um, intimate and powerful work on interrogating the racial policies that Wilson put forth, as well as some of the other foreign policies that he is more famously known for. Uh, this also is an opportunity for someone uh, who is uh, maybe not quite ready for a number one uh, position yet, but but has that aptitude, has that has has that vision, and to work uh, under a, a great leader like Elizabeth Karcher. And so uh, we have those three are our three main uh, leadership positions we have at our stewardship sites. In the future, when, uh, we have a stewardship site in Monterey, California, called the Cooper Malera Adobe Site. That site, that job will be available hopefully in the next three months or so. That's a site where we are really digging into indigenous histories, Latinx histories, but we also need a leader there that's very entrepreneurial. It's in, located in downtown Monterey, and it has a um, it has a, a relationship with a with a cafe, a restaurant, and a special events uh, organization. So that that will be a great. Uh, opportunity for someone who's interested in um, in that type of work, and then we have uh, we have a couple of jobs um, in our co stewardship sites. One is at the James Madison Montpelier, which is a presidential site in Orange, Virginia. Uh, we that that um, hire is being handled by the Montpelier Foundation. They are co stewardship sites that we own the land, but a Montpelier Foundation runs that. Um, so if people are interested in that, uh, I would ask you all to send me your your uh, CVs and your cover letters. Um, I have my email available to you during this session, so you can email it to me. That is being handled by an executive search firm that the foundation hired. And then we also have another one at our affiliate at the Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket, which again is also a great opportunity to run uh, that site that's been around for almost 50 years now, um, which has the Africa Meeting House and is also a former schoolhouse over there in Boston. And, um, and if you're interested in that position, that's also being run by an executive search firm. So I would just ask you to again, email me your CV and your cover letter, and I'll make sure I pass it along to that search firm so they can have access to your information. And then lastly, we have uh, some, a, a, great, a great opportunity at another co stewardship site in California, in Woodside, California, Filoli, uh, which is really um, the chief experience officer 
which is someone who's going to lead the visitor experience there, as well as the DEAI efforts that they've gone through. Vailoli was part of the Facing Change program that was led by the American Alliance for Museums. And so they have done some work already the last two or three years. And I'm very familiar with that program because I also was a fellow in that program a couple of years ago. And um, they are ready to hire a, a leader in that to, uh, to move that work forward. And so with that, I'll leave it right there and pass it along to Elon. Thank you, Omar. So I'm going to be talking about um, the interpretation and education position. So most of them are manager and senior management level, and we also have an internship. So um, please, all of our positions that we're talking about today, if it's not, if you don't feel like it's right for you, but you know someone who it, who it is right for, please, please, please share and get the word out. Um, and if you have questions about these different positions, don't forget uh, to write those down because we can uh, talk through your questions when we get to uh, the breakout. So the first one that we have is a senior manager of collections and education at the Woodrow Wilson House in Washington, DC. The Wilson House has a really incredible collection of objects and art from all around the world, and also a really fascinating history when it comes to Woodrow Wilson, his wife and daughters, and also the Scott family who lived in the house, um, who were the domestic staff. So a lot of really interesting stories that can be told there. And the Wilson House, like all of our sites, are always looking for new perspectives and a variety of different ways of interpreting and exploring the objects and the histories. Next, we have uh, Woodlawn and Pope Leahy. So they're also looking for a senior manager, this time of public programs and interpretation. Uh, uh, Woodlawn Pope Leahy is, has been going through a really interesting transition in its interpretation over the last couple of years, um, refocusing the site, especially um, the main Woodlawn house, refocusing its narrative from a focus on a more traditional plantation narrative uh, to looking at and uh, plantation and architecture narrative to looking at the stories of the enslaved population and really exploring the human history of the site in new and more vigorous ways. They're also working on developing a, um, a descendant community at the site. So some really interesting stuff they've got going on there. They also have the Pope Leahy House because Woodlawn Pope Leahy is actually a double history, double house site. So um, uh, Pope Leahy House is a mid-century architecture site. Um, and so you've got two different really powerful and fascinating narratives to explore at the, um, right there. Next, we have the Senior Manager of Public Programs and Interpretation at the Edith Farnsworth Historic Site. So um, that one in Plano, Illinois, um, that one is actually right outside of Chicago. It's got a re um, really interesting, a women's history that they have just started really deeply exploring just in the last couple of years. Uh, this is a, the site was originally created by Edith Farnsworth, who was a, a physician who was way ahead of her time and was working with a master um, architect, uh, Mies van der Rohe. So anyone who's interested in feminist stories and mid-century architecture, definitely a lot of interesting things going on there. Now, these three senior manager positions, um, along, sorry, I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, so we have two more senior manager positions. Uh, we have one that will be coming online um, shortly at the Shadows on the Tesh. So these last three positions that are in black are not yet up on the website, but definitely check back over the coming month for them to come online. So the Senior Manager of Education and Interpretation at the Shadows on the Tesh. The Shadows is another one of our sites that's in transition when it comes to interpretation. So transitioning from a, a very traditional exploration of plantation and antebellum life to being more equitable in its exploration of the enslaved narratives and also exploring indigenous histories and queer histories. And it's also um, another one of our really interesting feminist history sites. So um, definitely lots to talk about for all of these sites. I've been doing a lot of close work with that particular one. So if you have questions, I have a lot that I can share on that one. 
um, and they are in New Iberia, Louisiana. Um, the Shadows also receives thousands of uh, public, private, parochial, and um, uh, uh, I forgot the other word. Does it, you know, when you're a uh, homeschool, thank you, homeschool students every single year. So uh, education programs are incredibly important. So we're doing a lot of work on education there, and we really hope that you or someone you know would be great for that position. Next, we have the Senior Manager of Interpretation and Education at Chesterwood in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So that's the site with uh, the sculptor for the Lincoln Memorial and others. That site, along with exploring uh, Daniel Chester French's art, is also trying to look for new perspectives on how to interpret his art. Since Daniel Chester French, uh, during his lifetime, had created some depictions of black and brown bodies, which today we may find to be more offensive. So how do we handle these kinds of representations of people who were disempowered back during the time um, in which the artist uh, was alive, um, but may have more power and, and um, how can we give these populations voice in the interpretation of this art um, today. And next we have the senior, um, senior manager position at Lindhurst in Terrytown, New York. So if we have any Gilded Age fans, um, the Gilded Age show on HBO, um, that is one of the filming locations for that show. So um, Lindhurst has a variety of really interesting opportunities uh, when it comes to interpretation education because of its long history um, and the many different owners of that site. It also has a massive collection of art and objects to explore. Um, and there are lots of interesting themes when it comes to uh, immigration, and uh, labor and labor exploitation, along with wealth accumulation and all kinds of really fascinating things. Um, and once again, if you have any questions, definitely let me know when we get to the breakouts. And next we are going to hear from Dave Ferguson. Thanks so much, uh, Elon. Uh, so yeah, want to start at the very top with our Associate Director of Corporate Relations. Of course, this is part of our marketing uh, division. And, you know, in this role, we're really looking for someone who can um, handle our campaigns and partnerships, right? For example, we have a uh, million dollar relationship with American Express to support uh, 25 restaurants owned by members of underrepresented groups. It's the um, supporting uh, historic small restaurants. So each one of those restaurants is receiving a grant of about $40,000 uh, to obviously uh, bolster their work. Uh, another piece of the puzzle in that role is conference sponsorships, which uh, are, are probably quite familiar to most of you. Uh, the person would also be doing work around licensing and royalties. Uh, we have a Bank of America affinity card as one example. Uh, also a relationship with uh, Historic Ho Hotels of America. Uh, another uh, aspect of the role is, is work around in-kind sponsorships. Right, this really kind of dovetails nicely with the uh, work we're doing at our historic sites. So Benjamin Moore Paints, for example, uh, provides paint for our historic sites, uh, which is really important and we greatly appreciate. And the last piece that I'll uh, just kind of highlight is uh, the membership program, right? So ideally we want someone who can come in and really uh, build out in creative ways our membership program at this sort of 5,000 to 50,000 uh, dollar level and think about the appropriate suite of, of benefits uh, that we could offer uh, those partners. Uh, from there, I'll quickly uh, discuss this bilingual manager of outreach and communications role, which is part of our Main Street America program. So this is actually taking the person to Puerto Rico and doing some work over there that's deeply engaged in community resilience. So the person would be working uh, across five communities in Puerto Rico to 
uh, really meet with stakeholders on the ground uh, and ultimately develop um, a community resilience plan. Uh, and they do that in conversation with the program director and compliance specialist. I should also say it's a grant funded position. So uh, the person would be in that role for about 10 to 14 months. But again, for someone who's bilingual, has um, experience, history, uh, cultural kind of affinity for Puerto Rico, uh, is bilingual, bilingual, we think uh, it'd be an ideal opportunity uh, to really do important work over there. Um, and then uh, I'll jump into the director of finance role. This uh, supports our African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, which uh, many of you may know has brought in, uh, I think just over $80 million uh, since 2017. Uh, the, the Action Fund itself has about 15 funds uh, including a $20 million, million dollar grant from Mackenzie Scott, about $7.5 million from Mellon, among uh, other sources. So the director would really be responsible for managing all of those funds, uh, ensuring proper time allocation, um, as well as the appropriate use of uh, restrictive funds, which, of course, are a huge piece of of, of the, the sort of grant stewardship puzzle. Uh, and then from there, uh, I'll briefly kind of touch on uh, the RFPs, re requests for proposals. So if you go to savingplaces.org, requests for proposals, you will find uh, at various points a number of, of RFPs. In this case, it's one, again, supporting the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, uh, around marketing and communication ser communication services. So if you or someone you know has expertise or is doing work in that area, we really encourage you to uh, click on this link and uh, submit, right? Because uh, we're looking for uh, folks that can do that work and support the Action Fund uh, in that way. And I think the next slide, thanks so much. Yeah, so uh, next we have these roles with uh, the National Trust uh, Community Investment Co Corporation. So this is actually an affiliate or subsidiary uh, of, the, of the trust. Uh, they're among the most active tax credit syndicators in the country. Uh, the organization supports um, the country's architectural heritage, community development, and renewable energy initiatives through the provision of an investment in federal and tax, state tax credits. So the first role there is uh, an asset manager role. Uh, in short, that person would oversee uh, the portfolio of historic tax credits, and or new market tax credits. Uh, and then of course, there's also the, the project manager role. Uh, and there they'd really be grappling with uh, real estate due diligence, um, underwriting activities for, for prospective tax credit investments, preparing investment committee write-ups um, and present investments for approval and also facilitating transaction closings. These uh, tax credit investments may include uh, debt and equity investments in residential, commercial, uh, and also mixed use historic rehabilitation projects involving historic and new market tax credits. Finally, uh, again, returning to the action fund, we're seeking an executive assistant to support the work of our um, African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund Executive Director, Brent Legs, as well as the uh, the team writ large. Um, so, you know, if you have interest in that work, again, we implore you to uh, to consider uh, applying. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of where we are. And just to give you a better idea on the process. So if you go to 
savingplaces.org slash careers. You'll find all of these openings uh, that we've all discussed. Um, and if you click on the link for any particular position, it will pull up the full job description. And if you scroll to the very bottom of the page, you will see a button that says submit application. Uh, you'll be able to go in, um, fill out the application, which um, is not too um, cumbersome and also attach uh, a cover letter and a resume. And uh, that will pretty much uh, satisfy the, uh, the application and, and what we're looking for there. So um, my telephone number is there, 202-588-6020. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions, concerns, um, and yeah, I think that's uh, that's all I have to 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 say, and happy to to share more and delve delve uh, deeper uh, in the breakout breakout session. So, thanks so much for your time. To uh, the larger group again, we just finished our small group small group breakout sessions, and so. Before we close out, what we wanted to do is I wanted to give um, Dave and Elon an opportunity to share about two or three common questions or concerns that came up, and then I'll do the same, and then we'll close out for the evening. So, uh, Elon, why don't you start us off? Sure. So um, three quick items for um, that work that came up in our group. Um, the first one being whether our stewardship sites have boards um, and whether, you know, especially for the sites that are maybe some doing, doing uh, are transitioning in their interpretation, that uh, whether there's a board um, that we have to go to uh, for permission or, or to work with them on the interpretation. And so for the stewardship sites, we actually do not have boards, but we do have advisory councils. Some of our stewardship sites have advisory councils that maybe are defunct and need to be revitalized, um, but they do all have some group um, they're supposed to be working with. Um, and some sites like uh, the Woodrow Wilson House has a really outstanding advisory council that does a lot of great work and contributions um, back to the site. So it kind of depends on which of our sites you're talking about. Um, we got a great question from Dave about uh, uh, David Field about um, whether the interpretation positions are in person um, or if there's availability for remote work. So for um, any of our interpretation and education positions, whether that's uh, the senior manager positions especially, um, will need to be in person at least a few days a week um, just for uh, to help with uh, security in case there's any kinds of you know, issues with the frontline, uh, you know, interpreters and guides uh, and volunteers or with the visitors, um, the manager and the uh, executive director, um, one or the other in most cases would need to be um, in person at a time. So um, most of those positions will need to be there um, every day um, or a few day, at least a few days a week. Um, so it's really up to the executive director of that site. Um, if you are looking for a remote position, please definitely continue to check out the um, request for proposal or the RFP page. Um, we put the link in the chat earlier. Um, and if Susie or Gerald can um, pop the RFP link back into the chat would be great. Please definitely keep up with that page um, or um, reach out to the executive directors or, or watch their so the social media for our sites. Um, because we do often, uh, we are often looking for contractors. Uh, so like the Shadows and the Tesh, we just recruited for a museum education uh, contractor to help us develop new um, education programs for the Shadows. Uh, because we just could not wait until the IED manager position um, got hired. So um, definitely be looking for those contractor positions. A lot of the contractor positions can be remote and from any part of the country. It really just depends on that particular contract. So just keep um, checking out the social media for the sites and um, 
our recruitment page, our careers page, and the RFP page for more updates. Thank you, Elon. That's great. Great wrap up. Dave, what do you have for us? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Omar. Uh, so yeah, nice, uh, robust conversation. Great questions. Um, we had some conversation and question around uh, climate, climate change, and sort of where the trust sits within within the realm of that discourse. Um, you know, and I sort of offered um, that I think the the way we kind of think about preservation um, on the one hand is is as a way to um, not only kind of preserve the path and preserve these buildings, but also um, a way to kind of stave off certain kinds of development that aren't necessarily in the best interest uh, of uh, the future of our planet. Uh, and I think also um, we're looking for opportunities uh, where we can find them to partner with organizations uh, that are doing, doing that work. But we, we certainly feel like Preservation in and of itself is a way of of kind of preserving um, the climate, and um, again, I think you know work with the the Nature Conservancy and other organizations that uh, have, have have really um, created a foundation in that space um, will will help us to really mitigate some of um, the worst aspects of of new development and growth and uh, any number of other forces that uh, will just make the world a more a more challenging place to inhabit. Um, so, so that was one thing we touched on. Had a great uh, question around um, our work, sort of supporting and telling stories uh, about Black women and girls. Um, and there, you know, I kind of thought of our work uh, around where women made history. Right, and I think there's uh, an opportunity there to uh, not only look to what we we've, we've done and the kind of stories that we've told, you know, from kind of the Madam C.J. Walkers, the Polly Murrays of the world, but also uh, to to sort of think deeper about um, other kinds of uh, women and girls that were foundation foundational in this nation's history, Black women and girls. Uh, specifically, um, but I think that's that's one place where we we've certainly begun to think about that work. Um, what what else? I think there were real conversations or questions from a couple of folks around uh, internships and uh, entry level positions, right? So that was an opportunity uh, to speak to um, our internship program. Um, and to to sort of create some interest in that um, and to let folks know that they can come in with, um, they don't have to be dyed in the wool preservationists to really be able to come in, spend eight weeks, learn from people at the, that are at the top of their field, what preservation is about uh, across a number of divisions, be it law, be it marketing, uh, be it preservation. Um, and take that experience potentially into uh, into a career, right, in the field. And that the, the internship is an opportunity both for uh, undergraduates and, and graduate students as, as well. So I think um, that was another another kind of space for conversation. Um, yeah, uh, from what I've heard from the trust funds, trust wide positions, uh, these internship programs, we uh, are supposed to spend like eight weeks working with professionals and through many departments and uh, putting to, and gaining experience for us to uh, work in a uh, full time position in the future. And uh, working with people who do reservation work, you have any idea of uh, what kind of assignments we might do? In the internship program or any internships or like entry level jobs? Yeah, I think uh, David David Field is on the call and he, he's um, been the brainchild behind the internship program for uh, many, many years now. So if he's on, I'll, I'll let him jump in and share his expertise. Great. Thanks, Dave. 
Um, yeah, so um, I'm the assistant director of HR for the National Trust, but one of my roles is coordinating our summer intern program. So uh, every summer we have about 15 to 20 internships, typically in all different departments of the trust. So as Dave mentioned, some of them might be very preservation related or at our historic sites, but others might be in marketing or uh, working for the magazines or journalism background or PR and outreach. Um, uh, so uh, typically uh, we get proposals from our managers uh, in January and post them starting in February uh, and March uh, and recruit through the spring uh, for a formal program that runs from the beginning of Jul June through the end of July, uh, eight weeks. Um, uh, each of the interns works on an individual project, works closely with their supervisor but other colleagues uh, in the, the host department. So uh, they really have an opportunity to network with professionals uh, at the trust or in their field. Uh, but we also have weekly educational sessions. Uh, so each week we have staff members who present uh, about a different aspect of the trust work or the field of preservation or nonprofit advocacy. So it's an opportunity to learn more broadly uh, about the work that we do beyond the individual uh, project that somebody might be working on. Uh, and then of course, you're also networking with the other interns. Um, we're always looking for ways in the remote environment to, to have uh, the interns engage with the broader trust um, uh, community. Uh, so we're hoping this coming year to have more in addition to the educational sessions to have more sessions where you just have a chance to to chat and network with with colleagues at the trust so there are opportunities to uh, gain some early career experience sometimes they lead to job opportunities it's it's not the kind of intern program where it's a training program that leads you into a, a paid position but we've had any number of interns who have uh, worked with us over a summer and then either continued in a career position or come back to the trust uh, to take an early career entry level uh, job opportunity. Uh, so um, uh, we're just in the process of starting the transition from me to Dave. Uh, he'll be overseeing that program in the future as well as handling our recruitment. Uh, but for this coming year's cycle, we'll be working together. So either one of us would be able would uh, be happy to serve as a contact for anybody who might be interested in internships for themselves or perhaps works in an academic setting where you have uh, a cohort of students uh, that you might refer to us if they have an interest in history uh, and preservation. Thanks, David. We also, I'll mention, uh, we have a our uh, Mildred Kolodny Scholarship Program, uh, which provides a tuition grant to students who are interested in pursuing graduate degrees in preservation or related fields. Uh, that also includes an internship opportunity and an opportunity to attend our national conference um, uh, free of charge, uh, and we're just starting uh, this coming year's cycle for recruitment for that program. So uh, that's something else that we can answer questions for you about. Oh, it's the uh, Mildred Kolodny Scholarship Program. So if you just Google that, um, you'll find it. Uh, it's on the uh, forum section of our website. All right, sounds good. Thank you. That was an excellent question, Cameron. Um, I'm glad you you spoke up about that. As someone who used to manage internships at the Smithsonian, I know how imperative this experience is and how it can launch launches careers all the time. Um, I wanted to also share, I mean, we, our group also talked a lot about the same things the other two groups talked about, remote work and the possibility of that. Has it been increasing? Has it been steadying? Um, the other question that we had were how soon are we going to get to these interviews, right? When are we going to start interviewing people and screening people? And what I shared with them was, I think both for the executive positions and the senior manager positions, um, some of those will get started within two weeks. The other ones I think will get started maybe three to four weeks, depending on how things go. We're really hoping to do something different with this webinar, but we wanted to see what kind of manifested from that. So I would really encourage you all, if you are interested in any of the positions that you heard about, do not wait any longer. Some of them have already been out. I think we did mention that earlier. So some, some people have already been in the queue. And so we are really looking to um, take these candidates in consideration. So if you're interested in applying, I would not wait too much longer. Uh, hopefully get your applications in 
before the end of the weekend if you have if you have the time time to do so. Um, that would be really important. The other thing we talked about were characteristics, especially in particular for the leadership. You know, we're looking for empathetic leaders, people who are visionary, people who can work with uh, different types of folks, who can work with the community, uh, who can be able to build uh, organizational culture. You know, good friend uh, Chris Taylor, and so you know Chris, he always taught me the term. You know that 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 culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and those are the type of leaders that we need. They really take that to heart um, in, in, in the institutions that they help lead and with the communities they help to lock arms with. And so um, those are the things that, that, we, uh, that we discussed. Um, I see that we're pretty much past the time, but what I would like to do in closing is again, thank you, give thank you to all of you for giving your time, especially to, um, Museum Hugh and to Triple AM, I see the vedette and um and Stephanie were still with us and participated, which was awesome to see. Uh thank you to all of our colleagues like David Field and Elizabeth Karcher and and others who are who were able to join us today. And um and what I wanted to kind of remind you of, you know, we're talking about this work. This work is is for passionate people, people who care about the community. Um, you know, I'm always reminded by one of my favorite quotes from Cornell West, where he says, justice is what love looks like in public. So if you love, if you, if you love inclusion, if you love telling the full American story, if you love helping people see the humanity in one another, consider the trust. Consider the trust. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you.